It's the end of winter, or near the end of winter, mid-March. This is a very tough time of the year for the grazing animals in the woods, especially the deer. They've gone through a hard winter. Uh, most of the food is not available to them that's going to be present within a month or so. And this is the time of the year when an awful lot of stress can occur. This is especially true for white-tailed deer. If they've had a number of mild winters, and hunting pressure hasn't been too severe. Because during those times, their populations have built up, and in many cases, they've become overpopulated. Most animals, especially lower animals, don't have mechanisms for dealing with this overpopulation. That is to say, the only result is starvation. Some of the higher mammals, like deer and groundhogs, I've found uh, with considerable amount of research, have an internal mechanism for controlling population size, at least to some extent. The name of this mechanism is so known as the Selye stress syndrome, obviously associated with stress. Selye was one of the first scientists, wildlife biologists, to isolate <clears throat> this mechanism. Others, such as Dr. Davis and Dr. Christian, have worked with other animals in regard to this stress syndrome with rats, with woodchucks or groundhogs, as I mentioned before. So that we know in many of the mammals, this internal mechanism is present. Basically, it functions as follows. At times of the year when stress can occur due to overpopulation, and stress associated with lack of food or other habitat limitations, these mammals mediate the stress through a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then sends a message to the master gland of the endocrine system called the pituitary gland. The message it sends via either the vascular system, the bloodstream, or via the nervous system, special neurons going to the posterior lobe of the pituitary. The message is one of stress, saying, let's produce the appropriate hormones, let's get the body geared physiologically to cope with this stress. Now, the pituitary will secrete hormones specifically to help the animal uh, get through these stressful periods. The anterior pituitary will secrete what is known as a tropic hormone that is sent via the bloodstream to the adrenal gland. Now, the adrenal gland monitors any stressful situations and produces chemical secretions or hormones that allow the animal to make physiological adjustments to handle the stress. There are two parts to the adrenal. The one part allows the, uh, the animal to respond to immediate stress. It secretes a, a hormone that you're familiar with, adrenaline. The other lobe secretes hormones, and these are the ones we're concerned about, that allow the organism to respond to a long-term stress. These hormones will provide the organism with ability to reduce inflammation, uh, an increase, a slow increase in sugar concentration in the blood to allow the organism to have more energy to respond to stress, and a variety of different kinds of physiological responses. Scientists have found that it's fairly easy to find if animals within a population are extremely stressed because of overcrowding because their adrenals will start to swell. In other words, they'll be bombarded with so many messages from the hypothalamus via the pituitary to the adrenal glands that the adrenal glands can't compensate, can't produce hormones rapidly enough, and therefore will swell in size. Work that Davis and Christian did with groundhogs showed a direct correlation with overpopulation and the weight of individual adrenal glands. How does this help control the population? Well, the adrenal glands, the hormones associated with it, the ones that you'd be most familiar with would be the cortisones. The manufacturer, the manufacturing, or the process of building these hormones for the adrenal are the same pathways involved with the production of the sex hormones. And in fact, some of the adrenal hormones have an effect on sexuality in the mammals. For example, the androgenic hormones from the adrenal glands 
affect the male of the species in terms of their sexual development. Now, as the adrenal hormone production goes up in response to stress and to deal with stress, this means that the production rate of the sex hormones decreases. Well, I think if you think a little bit about this, the effects would be fairly obvious. In the males, since androgenic hormones and testosterone, the male sex hormones, are not being produced in sufficient quantity, the males lose their interest, literally, in breeding or sexual reproduction. It has an effect on the females as well. As these, ster excuse me, as these adrenal hormones become more and more dominant, the female sex hormones start to decline. Well, one major effect that it has is that it tends to block ovulation. And in fact, even blocks the production of ova or eggs. Now, let's assume that even with the stress on the males and the females, that there is some ovulation and that there are some males that are interested in reproducing and therefore can provide sperm. Well, what they found is that one of the major sex hormones produced by the deer themselves in the females is a hormone that maintains pregnancy. So that even if conception occurs, even if a zygote and an embryo is formed, that this reduction in this particular hormone will block the maintenance of pregnancy. So that basically what will occur is a high rate of natural abortion. This, of course, prevents new offspring from coming, in the coming into the population as well. Now, let's assume that all these blocking mechanisms have been uh, circumvented, that in fact a young doe, excuse me, a young fawn is born. Well, even then, Cellier stress syndrome can limit the population size. Because these same hormones we've been talking about associated with the female reproductive system also controls development of the breasts and ultimate lactation or the production of milk. So that even if that young fawn is born, there is no guarantee with all of the hormonal uh, changes that have occurred that there'll be sufficient milk for that young fawn to survive. I know this seems cruel, but nature in that regard is cruel. Basically what this means is that all of these mechanisms have one thing in common. All of these mechanisms are prohibiting the increase in population size and therefore reducing the stress and the chances of loss to starvation within that deer or groundhog population.